Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have my bedroom voice on already. I hope it will last me okay. It doesn't hurt. So I'm hoping we're going to be all right. Okay, hopefully we will not have a rerun of last night, and we will cruise on through until the hours are over. Okay, um, let's see what you learned yesterday. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to give you some cases. I'm going to talk about these cases out loud to myself. As I work my way through, I may ask you questions. You, you can enter on the public chat. <clears throat> And hopefully it'll be helpful to you. So let's start out with early pregnancy bleeding. You remember the algorithm? <clears throat> and what I want you to pay attention to is right down here, speculum exam and vaginal sonogram. That's going to be our key anytime there is early pregnancy bleeding. Okay, here's our case. 18-year-old, gravidal 1 para 0, at 9 weeks gestation by last menstrual period, comes to the outpatient office because of vaginal bleeding for 24 hours. So we have an early pregnancy. We have acute bleeding for a short period of time. Is that common? Yes, we talked about this yesterday. A qualitative urine beta HCG is positive. Is she pregnant? If the beta HCG is positive, she has chorionic tissue. So yes, she is pregnant. She denies cramping or vaginal passage of tissue. What is our next step in management? Speculum exam, vaginal sonogram, observation, DNC, schedule, DNC, emergency. And the next thing has to be exactly a speculum exam. Don't forget that. Because what are we going to do with a speculum exam? We're going to look to see if there is a vaginal or cervical lesion. And secondly, what are we going to look for? Is the cervix open or closed? Okay. The new information is in blue. Speculum exam shows dark blood in the vagina with the cervix closed. No vaginal or cervical lesions. All right. No cervical and vaginal lesions. Next thing we want to move to is remove the polyp, vaginal sonogram, observation, DNC. No, we want to see what's in the uterus. Vaginal sonogram. Those two will manage it. Now, let's change the scenario just a little bit. The speculum exam shows a cervix that is closed with a 10 millimeter bleeding cervical polyp. Now, what would you do? Well, you've got an anatomic explanation, right? You've got an anatomic explanation. Let's take it out. We can remove the polyp. And I have a video clip that I'll show you later of how you do it. You just put a ring force upon, twist it, and you can take it out. Okay, let's go on now and a different scenario. Well, the first part is the same. Speculum exam shows the internal cervical loss is closed. What are your two differentials with the cervix closed? It's going to be either a missed abortion or a threatened abortion. And what will tell us what the difference is it is a vaginal sonogram. Sonogram shows a viable nine-week normal appearing embryo and gestational sac. What is our working diagnosis if the cervix is closed? If there is a viable pregnancy, it is going to be threatened abortion. How many options do we have in management for a threatened abortion? Solamente uno, only one, and that will be observation. Very good. All right, moving on. Speculum exam shows the cervical os is closed. However, the sonogram shows an eight-week gestational sac and a fetal pole without cardiac motion. So we have the cervix closed. We have a non-viable pregnancy. What is our working diagnosis? It will be missed abortion. And how many options do we have for missed abortion? And I realize this is not how the real exam is. You can't choose three. But you could either do observation, you could either do mesoprostal prostaglandin E1, or you could do a scheduled DNC if she needs to get it done on a particular time. So three options with missed abortion. 
I like the better term is embryonic demise. And the most common reason for this is chromosomal anomalies. Okay, she's experiencing cramping, denies patches of tissue, speculum exam shows the internal cervical os is open. What is our differential now? Our differential is inevitable abortion, incomplete abortion, or a completed abortion. How do you tell the difference? Sonogram. Sonogram shows an intact eight-week gestational sac and embryo with cardiac motion. What is going on here? What's our working diagnosis? Cervix open, a viable embryo, not past any tissue. Inevitable. How many options do we have for inevitable? The same as for a missed. Three. A, B, or C. Are you with me on that? This is a tough situation because this pregnancy, the embryo is still alive, but it's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. It is inevitable. Okay, speculum exam shows internal cervical loss is open. Sonogram shows products of conception within the uterine cavity, but no viable embryo, which means she has passed some tissue, some remains. The diagnosis is going to be incomplete abortion. How many options do we have for incomplete abortion? The same as for an inevitable three observation, misoprostol, emergency DNC. Let's change the scenario just a little bit. It's the same as before, but she is bleeding heavily. Are you going to observe? Are you going to give them misoprostol? Or what are you going to do an emergency DNC? And I would do an emergency DNC. So the clinical situation will push you one way or the other. Are, are you with me on that? So patient preference is important and the clinical situation. All right. So we will do an emergency DNC if she's bleeding out. Okay, the cervical os is open. Sonogram shows empty uterine cavity with a wide endometrial stripe. She has passed everything. It is all gone. What is our working diagnosis? It's going to be completed abortion. And how many options do we have? Only one, and that is going to be observation. Now, what if you didn't know that she had passed tissue? And you have a patient who has a pregnancy test, which is positive, but the uterine cavity is empty. You need to think, could she have an ectopic pregnancy? The endometrial stripe is the anterior and the posterior walls of the uterus, which are right next to each other, and you can actually measure the width of the endometrium. This is what you would see with a completed abortion, because with pregnancy, you have a thicker endometrial stripe than if she was not pregnant in the secretory phase. I'll show you some pictures of that later. Okay, now we haven't gone over this, but look at this case. 18-year-old gravid one per zero, nine weeks gestation by LMP, comes to the outpatient office because of severe nausea and vomiting, as well as vaginal bleeding. She states she passed what looks like grapes out of her vagina. Her serum quantitative beta C jitter is 200,000. Transvaginal sonogram shows enlarged uterus with homogeneous diffuse intrauterine cysts. What's the diagnosis? Molar pregnancy. What are you going to do for this one? That's going to be a DNC. We'll talk more about that. And the last case we have talked about, actually, this is an ectopic pregnancy. She has uh, uh, nine weeks from her last menstrual period, vaginal bleeding, left lower quadrant pain. We'll talk about that coming up in just a minute. Okay, was that helpful? Okay, let's go through fetal demise. Okay, notice what are the, the questions we want to ask. What does abdominal sonogram show? Is DIC present? Is mom ready to empty the uterus? Do we need an, do we need an autopsy? Because that will tell us what we're going to do to empty the uterus and what's the gestational age. That will also be important. So let's go with our first case. 25-year-old gravid of 2 pair one 19 weeks gestation. 
Now, a seven-week sonogram confirmed the dates. How accurate is a seven-week sonogram in confirming dates? Plus or minus five days. So we know she's got to be 19 weeks size. I mean, 19 weeks. But the uterine size today is only 15 weeks. When you have a uterus which is smaller than dates, earlier than 20 weeks, you need to think of, could she have a fetal demise? You listen with a Doppler, you can't hear any fetal heart tones. What is your thinking? Could she have a fetal death? Next step in management, abdominal sonogram. That's the only way. Don't do an NST. Don't listen for fetal heart tones. Well, you can listen with fetal heart tones, but the definitive diagnosis has to be made with a, a sonogram. And a 15-week uh, ut uterus is outside of the pelvis. It is in the abdominal cavity. All right, change the scenario just a little bit. Instead of being 19 weeks, she is 28 weeks. A seven-week sonogram confirmed dates. We know that's very accurate. The mom says no fetal movements for two days, no fetal heart tones with a Doppler. Remember, prior to 20 weeks, the most common finding with fetal death is no fetal, is a uterus smaller than dates. After 20 weeks, it is no fetal movements. So in this case as well, our concern is fetal death. The only way we can, can identify this is abdominal sonogram. Okay, uh, we do a sonogram. It shows fetal demise. So that is confirmed. There's no cardiac motion. Fetal spine is angulated. Remember, we talked about that. Tissue is edematous. Is this a short duration of a fetal demise or is it a long duration of fetal demise? This is prolonged. What are you concerned with? What are you concerned with? DIC. Next step in management is a DIC panel. What's the DIC panel? Platelets. PTPTT, fibrinogen, fibrin spirit products, D dimer. Okay. All right. DIC panel shows platelets of 60. What's normal platelets? Over 150. Certainly over 100. So this is low. Fibrinogen is 120. All of the plasma proteins go up except albumin. Fibrinogen should be three or 400. This is DIC. Now what do you do? She's 20. 28 weeks gestation. What are the only two ways you can empty the uterus? Induction of labor or a DNE. You don't want to do a cesarean. At 28 weeks, it's going to be prostaglandin PGE2 uh, uh, induction of labor. Would you give a platelet transfusion at 60,000? Would you give a platelet transfusion? No. I would wait until 50,000 if I'm doing a, a procedure or 20,000 if I was not doing a procedure. Okay, so prostaglandin E2. Let's change the scenario. Instead of 28 weeks, it's exactly the same, but it is 18 weeks, and she's got DIC. What would be your next step in management? Here is where I would go with dilation and evacuation. The reason you wouldn't do a DNE with a 28 week is because the fetus is too big to pull apart. You can't do it. That's why you need to induce labor, but Less than 20 weeks, you can. And that would be quicker, and particularly with a life-threatening situation. Okay, she's 28 weeks. Multiple fetal anomalies are present. Mom is psychologically ready to empty the uterus. And we have confirmed no fetal heart tones. The diagnosis is not in question. It's fetal demise. The management will depend upon is mom psychologically ready or not. She is ready. Now, how do we determine whether or not we need to do a DNE or a induction of labor? It's going to be two things, gestational age, less than 20 weeks or over 20 weeks, and do we need an autopsy? With multiple fetal anomalies, you want to do an autopsy. So in addition, we have 28 weeks. So we're going to do a prostaglandin induction. Are you with me on that? I can see you're, you're getting the, the, the point. Okay, change the scenario exactly the same, except with multiple fetal anomalies, she's 18 weeks. You see the difference? 28 weeks, 18. Even though technically you could do a DNE at 18 weeks, with multiple fetal anomalies, you want to do an autopsy. So I would do a prostaglandin induction. 
the same. Do you see that, what I'm trying to get at here? Okay, 28 weeks, no fetal anomalies. Mom is ready to empty the uterus because of the gestational age being over 20 weeks. You can't do a DMP. So this is going to have to be an induction of labor. 18 weeks gestation, no fetal movements for two days, no fetal heart tones, no fetal anomalies. Now what would you want to do? See, at 18 weeks, if you don't need an autopsy, you could do a DNE or you could do prostaglandin. But I would say a DNE would be the reasonable one on the exam for this one. All right, let's uh, go to ectopic pregnancy. What are the things you need to know? Here they are, five of them. What does speculum exam show? What does beta HCG titer show? What's vaginal sonogram show? Do we need to do medical or surgical treatment? And follow-up titers. All right, let's go. 19-year-old female comes to the emergency department complaining of acute onset, 12 hours, of vaginal bleeding, left lower quadrant pain. Last menstrual period was eight weeks ago. There is our triad. There's our triad. Pain, bleeding, amenorrhea. Need to think of ectopic pregnancy. She is sexually active, but using condoms. How good are condoms in preventing pregnancy? They can be good, but they can often fail. Left lower quadrant is tender to palpation, but look at this. Her blood pressure is down. Her pulse is up. She is hypovolemic. What's going to be your next step in action? Laparotomy, vaginal uh, sonoma and titer methotrexate, laparoscopy, or serial bait. She is bleeding out. You're going to have to close this, open her up, and, and stop the bleeding quickly. I would do a laparotomy. You're right. Laparotomy. Emergency. Mrs. Jones, you're bleeding heavily. We're going to take good care of you. Okay, let's change the scenario. Exactly the same, but look at her blood pressure. 110 over 70. Pulse is 80. She is stable. If you have a patient who has a triad of ectopic, but she is stable, now we can proceed in an organized way. What would be the next step in management? She's bleeding, right? What did I say you need to do anytime a patient is bleeding? Speculum exam. I say I caught you on that one. Do a speculum exam. You can do that in your office. It costs nothing. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't put down the speculum exam shows no lesions, which I should have. So uh, let's skip that one and go to the next one. If the speculum exam shows no lesions, now what is your next step in management? And that's where you would do the beta HCG titer and the vaginal sonogram. And if they would ask you what order, I would do the speculum exam first, beta HCG, and then the vaginal sono, because if the beta HCG is negative, she's not pregnant. So let's see what the beta HCG titer is and what the vaginal sonogram shows. Okay, beta HCG is 900. Vaginal sonogram, no intrauterine gestational sac. Is it ectopic? Could be. Is it normal pregnancy? Could be. How are you going to find out? Repeat. You got the picture. We're going to repeat this and see what it's... Uh, and we could do this repeat in a couple of three days. Let's see what it shows. Okay, we repeat it, and now it is 2,500. And the vaginal sonogram shows no intrauterine gestational sign. If the beta HCG is over 1,500, no intrauterine gestational sign, that is by definition ectopic pregnancy. And if she's stable, we will consider it unruptured. All right, so now what do we want to do? We want to identify, is it early? Is it advanced? 2,500 would be early. Management of early would be what treatment? Medical or surgical? Medical. Methotrexate. All right. I am methe methotrexate dose is administered. Now what? Now what are you going to do? You gave the methotrexate. Did it work? How are you going to find out if it worked? You're going to do... Serial beta HCG titers. You're right on. Because what you would expect initially 
it will go up because the tissue is being destroyed. And once it releases the beta ACG, it should start coming down and down and down and down. Okay, let's change the scenario. Quantitative beta ACG is 8,500. Vaginal sonogram shows no inferior gestational sac. Would you call this early or advanced? This would be advanced. Advanced ectopic, medical or surgical treatment. This is going to be surgical treatment. The most likely treatment is a laparoscopy, and we're going to do a linear salpingostomy. We'll talk more about laparoscopy. It's a minimally invasive procedure, usually outpatient. Okay, so she's 19. We do a laparoscopic left salpingostomy. We make an opening in the tube. We dissect out as much of the trophoblastic tissue. How do you know if you got enough? How do you know if you have taken enough of that trophoblastic tissue out? The only way is to do serial beta-HCG titers. So if you give methotrexate, if you do a salpigostomy, you've got to follow up with serial beta-HCG titers. Now, she's 19. She will probably want you to be conservative, to leave the tube there if possible. What if she was exactly the same? She was 39 years old, but otherwise exactly the same. And you found an ectopic. What will she want you to do? She wants you to take the tube out. So we would do a laparoscopic left salpingectomy. Take it out. Do we need to do serial beta HCG titers if there is a removal of the tube? No, because the trophoblastic tissue is all gone, right? You've taken it out with the tube. So this is just observation. This is just observation. You should not have metastasis with an ectopic. If you're talking about a uh, molar pregnancy, different story. This is not a molar pregnancy. Not a molar pregnancy. Okay, I think that's all on that. And uh, Amanda, if we can go to chapter four. And that will be management of the normal pregnancy. All right, I've got a lot more of questions. We will go over a lot of questions before our time is over. Okay. Uh, all right, chapter four. Okay, waiting for chapter four. All right, there we go. Okay, here we go. This is on your handout, first prenatal visit. What are the tasks? What are the goals? What do we need to do on the first prenatal visit? Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Mark. Can you hear me okay?
looks like we have a minor there. Can you hear me now? Okay. Are we there? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, we are. Okay, what is the tasks of the first prenatal visit? The first thing we want to do is to confirm the pregnancy. Second is how far along is she? Are there any risk factors? And order laboratory tests. And then when do you want to see her again? This would be the first prenatal visit. Okay, let's first start with confirm the pregnancy. What is the most common way we confirm the pregnancy? A urine beta HCG. It is done in the urine. It is yes or no. It is cheap. It's inexpensive. You can do it in your office. That's the most common. Is it a definitive evidence of pregnancy? No. The definitive evidence of pregnancy is hearing fetal heart tones with a Doppler, separate and distinct from the mother, and ultrasound. So I would like to do an ultrasound. But if you don't have an ultrasound, a beta HCG and fetal heart tones would be fine. Next, dating the pregnancy. What is the way we usually date the pregnancy? Menstrual history. When was your last menstrual period? Now, that's not precise. It's only an estimate, but that's where we start. Now, clinical landmarks are where we'd feel for the uterine size on pelvic exam. We listen for fetal heart tones with a Doppler. When does the mom first feel the baby move? Those kinds of things. Those are clinical landmarks. We can use that for dating the pregnancy. But probably the most accurate, besides a good, reliable last menstrual period, is a sonogram. In the first trimester, we measure the CRL. What's CRL mean? Crown rump length, gold leaf. Exactly. There's crown rump length, plus or minus five days in the first trimester, by parietal diameter, plus or minus seven days. So that's going to be what we use for dating. Next, other risk factors, and we're going to go into all of these later on. Other obstetric risk factors are the medical, surgical, hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease, cardiac disease, social, family, sexual risk factors, HPV, HIV, lifestyle factors, teratogenic, all kinds of stuff. Prenatal labs, we're going to go over that in some detail. And I have divided them into three groups. One, early diagnosis of problems for maternal benefit. Two, early diagnosis of problems for fetal benefit. And three, are there immunizations that we need to give? Now, return visit. If she is low risk, if she has no particular problems which are facing, then we can see her every month until the beginning of the second trimester. The second trimester starts about 28, 29 weeks. Then we will see her every two weeks from 28 weeks to 36 weeks. And then we will see her weekly from 36 weeks on. And the reason for seeing her more frequently as the pregnancy goes further is that that's when the problems develop. That's when preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, IUGR, anemia, that's when that shows up. Okay, diagnosis of pregnancy. The most common symptom of pregnancy is amenorrhea. Are all amenorrheic women pregnant? No. Thank you, Lord. What is the most common sign of pregnancy? Symptom is what the patient complains about. Sign is what you find. On physical exam, you have an enlarged uterus. That's the most common. Now, is every enlarged uterus a pregnant uterus? No. Thank you, Lord. The diagnosis most commonly is made with a beta HCG, either a urine or a serum, quantitative, qualitative. The cheapest way is to take your Doppler and listen for fetal heart tones. And you can hear that as early as 10 to 12 weeks on a woman who doesn't have a, a thick abdominal wall. Sonogram, as I said, I like. Of course, that's me. And I think that that is going to be probably the most helpful. And I think there is good evidence to suggest that we should be doing more sonograms early. The Institute of Medicine says we should. Okay, this is in your book. It is on page 33. But let's go back here. We can look at signs of pregnancy as presumptive, probable, and definitive. The presumptive are unrelated to the uterus or fetus. Amenorrhea is the most common. Probable. They're related to the uterus 
or the mom's feelings, but not related to the fetus. And that would be enlarged uterus, uteromegaly. Beta HCG is probable. It's not definitive because beta HCG can come from an ovarian tumor, right? Corneal carcinoma produces beta HCG. The, the most helpful, the definitive, is sonogram of the fetus. Here, fetal heart tones independent of the mom or an external examiner who is feeling and can feel movements. Not the mother, but the, uh, the uh, not the mother feeling the fetus, but an external examiner. Amanda, if you could have ready the fetal movement uh, video clip, we'll show that pretty soon. Okay, so this is on page 33 in your book. All right, establishing gestational age. The ideal way of identifying gestational age is to know when conception occurred, to be in the bedroom when the, the, the couple had sex. But we can't obviously do that, but we can if there is in vitro fertilization, know when conception occurred. If there is a uh, artificial insemination, if there is a intrauterine insemination, then we know, and that would be 38 weeks from conception. The most common way is to take the last menstrual period and go 40 weeks from the last menstrual period. Now, basal body temperature can be helpful because basal body temperature will rise in the presence of progesterone. And at the time of ovulation, corpus luteum produces progesterone, and we should see the thermogenic effect of progesterone on the brainstem raising basal body temperature. I'll show you that in just a minute. As I mentioned, the most common sign is an enlarged uterus. The size of the uterus is enlarged. The best, of course, I would say, is sonogram. All right, now we're gonna look at pregnancy dating from a number of different views. And I'm gonna be talking about this right here, but I put it into my own format. We're gonna look at conceptional dating, menstrual dating, and Nagel's rule. If you know when conception occurred, you can go 266 days or 38 weeks from conception, and that would be your uh, due date. That would be the ideal way. Most of the time, however, we have to use menstrual dating. And then we will go 280 days or 40 weeks from the last menstrual period, the first day of the last menstrual period. But remember, the menstrual dating assumes the cycle length of 28 days. Are all cycles 28 days? No, they could be shorter, they could be longer. So you're gonna to have to adjust and I'll show you how we do that. Nagel's rule is the poor person's way of calculating due date. You take the last menstrual period, subtract three days, at three months, add seven days. And it gives you an approximation. This is our pregnancy wheel, and you've seen this. All right, the last menstrual period, December 21. Conception occurred then on January 4, can you see right here? If let's say today would be July 15, she would be 29 weeks and four days, and her due date would be right here at 40 weeks at September 27. See, this is a pregnancy wheel, but it assumes a 28-day cycle, all right? And this is on page 34 in your book. And it shows what happened in terms of ovulation, with a three-week cycle, with a four-week cycle, with a five-week cycle. Notice there is a constant luteal phase. The last half of the cycle is always two weeks. Why is it always two weeks? Because that is the lifespan of the corpus luteum. So with a four-week cycle, two-week proliferative phase, ovulation occurs on day 14. With a three-week cycle, there's a one-week proliferative phase. Ovulation occurs on day seven, and with a five-week cycle, 
there's a three week pre ovulatory or proliferative phase. Ovulation occurs on day 21. Do you see the difference there? Okay, that's the difference. Now, what are you going to have to do? If you have a four week cycle, then the calculation is going to be accurate. Okay, for the four week cycle, the true due date equals the calculated due date. Whether you go from the 38 weeks from fertilization or 40 weeks in the last menstrual period. Now, with a three week cycle, do you notice that ovulation and conception would have occurred seven days earlier? Okay. So, if you use a uh, last menstrual period and the, the calculator wheel, it's going to overestimate when the due date is. It's actually seven days earlier. So, with a three week cycle, the true due date is earlier than the calculated due date. This is the opposite, where you have a five week cycle. And with a five-week cycle, the true due date is later than the calculated due date. That's why it's important to ask the patient, do you have three-week, four-week, five-week cycles? And we have to adapt. We have need to adjust the um, last or the uh, due date based upon what the length of her cycle is. All right. This is key information. Based on body temperature, here we see the day of the menstrual cycle, and this is the base of body temperature prior to ovulation. And use a special thermometer. It has very clear gradations every half of a degree. The woman puts it in her vagina in, her, in the morning before she gets up, before she does anything, a basal body temperature. And what you would see is when the ovulation takes place, it, if it does, corpus luteum is formed, gesture is made, that has a thermogenic effect, raising the temperature. And so it's going to be a degree or so above what it was before. And so we would then say that conception, see, the uh, egg is fertilizable for 12 to 24 hours. So it's not going to be fertilizable for a long period of time. When does the temperature go up? How long does it take for enough progesterone to be made to cause the temperature to go up? It's probably going to be a day or two. So it's not precise, but it gives a pretty good estimate. Menstrual history. If the last menstrual period was definitive, I know when it occurred. I wrote it in my little black book. It was a normal menstrual cycle just like the others. If the pregnancy was planned and she was not using contraception, she wanted to get pregnant, that makes the last menstrual period very reliable. When you look at the length of menstrual cycles in women who are ovulatory, this is a histogram which shows that. You can see the length of the cycle can be anywhere from 21 days, 35 days. Now it's true, the mode the mean, the median, is 28 days. But you can see most women are either less or more than 28 days. That's why it's important that we use the length of the cycle to adjust. All right, this is just reiterating what I already said. With a 21-day cycle, ovulation occurs on day 7. On a 28-day cycle, ovulation occurs on day 14. On a 35-day cycle, ovulation occurs on day 21. See, it's a secretory phase, which is constant, because that is determined by the lifespan of the corpus luteum. Now, here are three embryos. Three women. They all have the same last menstrual period. But you can see by the sizes, these are clearly not the same gestational age. And the reason is, one woman had a 21-day cycle, another had a 28-day cycle, another one had a 35-day cycle. And so conception is different, even though the LMP is the same. Clinical landmarks. These are things that you can see clinically that might help you date the pregnancy. Early uterine size. When you do a pelvic exam on the first visit, 
six week signs, eight week signs, 10 week signs. That takes a lot of experience, but it can be helpful. Early fetal heart tones, I mentioned this before, you can hear them with a Doppler, 10 to 12 weeks, that's early. It's only helpful if you find it early. Quickening, mom says, I felt the baby move. When did she feel that? 16 to 18 weeks, 18 to 20 weeks, depending if she's had a previous pregnancy. Late fetal heart tones. Those would be heard with a fetoscope, and that we can hear at around 20 weeks. I haven't used one of those. I'll show you a picture coming up shortly. Late exam is measuring the height of the uterus with a tape measure from the pubic symphysis going up to the top of the pubis. And that should approximate the number of centimeters. Okay, already mentioned this, Doppler 10 to 12 weeks, fetoscope 18 to 20 weeks, quickening with a multigravita 16 to 18 weeks, quickening with a primigravita 18 to 20 weeks. This is all in your book as well. So these would be helpful to put together with ultrasound, with a last menstrual period, and we can come up hopefully with a good, solid pregnancy dating. This is a Doppler stethoscope. You've used these. It is much more sensitive than a fetoscope. There's a Doppler. Now this is a fetoscope. This is a younger obstetrician who I happen to know quite well. That's me a few years ago listening with a Dili fetoscope. I haven't used this for a long time. All right. Okay, Amanda, can we put the first video clip of fetal movement? This is quite striking. Look at this fetal movement. Now, this is a definitive evidence of pregnancy. Would you agree? That is a definitive evidence. I'm going to play it again because this is really striking. That baby is really moving. Okay, we can take that away, Amanda. Fundal height. The fundal height after 20 weeks should measure in centimeters the number of gestational weeks. So here we have the pubic symphysis, and it would be around 12 week size. The uh, uterus becomes an abdominal organ. When the uterus is up to the umbilicus, it should be about 20 weeks. Now midway is not going to be 16 centimeters but we call it 16 week size. But after 20 weeks, it should equal in centimeters from the pubis to the top of the fundus. So here I am measuring the fundal height. And here, if you look, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, perfect. But is it always perfect? No. Plus or minus two to three centimeters, depending on whether she weighs 80 pounds or whether she weighs 380 pounds. So that's going to make a difference. But generally, that's what we say. Now, here's a woman who is 20 weeks, but you can see her fundal height is up here. So what's going on here? Well, she has triplets. And all of them are boys. So when we use the centimeter rule, that's only with a single pregnancy, right? Now, this is actually a video clip, but it, I, I don't have the video uh, clip to pay. We have uh, this stroller with one, two, three babies. Mamma me. Okay, ultrasound dating. We've talked about this somewhat already. The CRL is the crown rump length. 
This is what we use in the first trimester. In the second trimester, we measure four things. BPD, bipyridal diameter, HC, head circumference, AC, abdominal circumference, and FL is the femur length. So here we go. This is a crown rump length. Crown, top of the head is the crown. This is the rump. Can you see there is a mandible, maxilla, nasal bone, skull is intact, spine is good, abdominal wall. This is great. We measure the crown rump length in the first trimester. Second trimester and third trimester, we measure the bipyridal diameter, which is from one side to the other, head circumference, which is all the way around, abdominal circumference, which is all the way around, and a femur length like here. There is the, bi the uh, head circumference. Here is the bipyridal diameter. Now, BPD is best for pregnancy dating because it is the most reliable measurement. The bipyridal diameter. When we look at estimating fetal weight, it is the abdominal circumference which is more accurate. But remember, the abdominal circumference does not have a bone like the skull around it. So if you have a big fat baby, the abdomen is bigger. Now we have nomograms where we can take the abdominal circumference, look on a chart, and say if this baby is 50 percentile, this is the gestational age. So here's a femur length the same way. So we come up with a femur length, gestational age, abdominal circumference, bipyridal diameter, the head circumference. Then we average those and we come up with an average ultrasound gestational age. Now this slide shows the variation in sonogram accuracy. And there's really one take home message here. And that is early in pregnancy, the accuracy is better. Later in pregnancy, accuracy is not good. So the earliest the ultrasound, the more accurate will be. And you can see less than 12 weeks, plus or minus five days, 12 to 18 weeks, plus or minus seven days, 18 to 24 weeks, plus or minus 10 to 11, and so on. If you have a number of sonograms, you don't change the due date based upon a subsequent one. You date based upon the earliest one if it is done well and you have a good reliable image. You only change the date if the difference between the last menstrual period, the due date, and the ultrasound due date is more than what you would expect in that gestational age. So in the first trimester, if let's say the ultrasound due date and the menstrual period due date were, were 10 days different, then I would change the due date. But if it was three days difference, I would leave and go with the LMP date. Are you with me on that? All right. Risk factors. We're going to go through a lot of risk factors as we talk later on. We're going to look at heart disease, thyroid, pulmonary, diabetes. Anyway, my point in this is to say, if it is a low-risk patient, no high-risk factors. Then we follow the standard protocol. High-risk patients, we're going to see more closer because they have special needs. And the protocol would be monthly up to 28 weeks, every other week until 36 weeks, and then weekly for 36 weeks. On. Okay. Normal pregnancy events. This is on page 36. The important thing here is they may very well ask you or present to you a case on the exam and your answer will be, I won't do anything. I will be just observing because it is a normal change. Let's look at these. First, I just want to look at the concept of trimesters. You can see the first tri trimester, second trimester, third trimester. When we say a 40-week pregnancy, and we divide by three. Well, it's really 13 and a third weeks for the first trimester, uh, 26 and two thirds weeks for the third, for the second, and then 40 weeks for the third trimester. But why don't we say 13 weeks each? There's nothing physiologic that happens between 13 and 14 weeks, 26 and 27. All we're really saying is early, middle, and late pregnancy. 
That's all the trimester. Okay, here on page 36, we look at what are the normal pregnancy events, first, second, and third. Look that over. It's going to be helpful. I will not be able to go over everything. But let's look at the handout. here. In the first trimester, one of the most common symptoms is nausea and vomiting. I would say 80% or more of women will have nausea and vomiting. Are they dehydrated? No. What do you do? It's conservative management. Try to avoid foods that make it worse. Eat crackers. Take small uh, amounts of fluid. What is the most common sign which comes, with, which is a problem? Vaginal bleeding. We talked about that. The most common reason for pregnancy loss is the chromosomal abnormality. But most of these will do fine. The management is looking with the speculum and doing a vaginal ultrasound. Weight gain, 5 to 8 pounds. The most common complication is spontaneous abortion. That's the first one. Second trimester, most common symptom is quickening. Quickening is mom's perception of the baby moving. What do you do about that? Nothing. Braxton Hicks contractions. These are rhythmic, long duration, maybe four to five minute long contractions of the uterus. Low intensity, they come and go once or twice an hour, starting as early as 14 weeks. What do you do with Braxnick's contractions? Nothing. Observation. Do they change the cervical dilation? No. Do they change the cervical effacement? No. Normal weight gain, one pound a week. See, the five to eight pounds in the first trimester, it's not from the fetus. It's not from the placenta. It's from the expansion of blood volume. After that has expanded, then we look for one pound a week in the second and third trimester. The most common complication is cervical insufficiency. We'll talk about that. The third trimester. Symptoms that we need to think about is lightning. Lightning is the term for when the baby engages. It comes down. The head comes into the pelvis. That can happen as early as 36 weeks. Now the mom can breathe easier, but now she's got pelvic pressure. What's the management? Conservative. Bloody show. What is bloody show? This is the uh, uterus. This is a cervix. And the endocervical canal has columnar epithelium. The blood vessels are only one cell away from the surface. And as the cervix starts to dilate, you can get bleeding from these vessels. And you can have release of mucus. And they call that a bloody show. As the cervix dilates, mucus and blood are released. Is there a problem? No. Do you need to do anything about it? No. It's conservative management. Okay, now the complications. Premature rupture membranes, premature labor, pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational diabetes, and lots of other ones. So just put this in the back of your brain someplace. You may find that helpful on the exam. This is the Nagel's rule. I don't know why it got here. But let's say the last menstrual period was July 4. You subtract three months, July, June, May, April. You add seven days, 11. So LMP, July 4, estimated due date, April 11. That's the Nagel's rule. I just show you this not for you to remember the numbers. But remember the first one, normal weight of the, if you have a woman who has normal pre-pregnancy weight, she should gain 25 to 35 pounds. If she's underweight, gain more. If she's overweight, gain less. If she's carrying twins, obviously she'll gain more. But the normal weight gain is 25 to 35 pounds. On page 40, actually it's not page 40. This is page 36 to 37. It's got normal pregnancy complaints. I'm not going to go over this in detail. If you would like to just look that over and see, a lot of these are just very simple, homely remedies. On page 38, however, is this pregnancy danger sign. And this you should know. If the, and we should ask the patient when she comes in, 
for her prenatal visits. Any vaginal bleeding? If she says yes in early pregnancy, you better think about the things we just talked about, spontaneous abortion. Later on, second, third trimester, we think of abductual placenta, placenta preview. Are you having any vaginal fluid leakage? That could be rupture of membranes. We'll talk about that. But it could also be urinary incontinence. And we'll talk about how you do a speculum exam to, pull, to, to figure this out. Now, epigastric pain, what's the most common cause of epigastric pain in pregnancy? Reflux, GERD, right? However, what we always need to rule out is severe preeclampsia. And how can you do that? Just the blood pressure. You're cramping, it could be preterm labor, it could be preterm contractions. What's the difference between preterm labor and preterm contractions? Preterm contractions do not change the cervical dilation or effacement. Preterm labor will we'll come back. Decreased fetal movements, that's always a concern. Is the baby compromised in some way? Is there vomiting, hyperemesis early in pregnancy, hepatitis, pyonephritis later in pregnancy? Headache, visual changes, preeclampsia. That's going to be severe preeclampsia. Any pain with urination? We'll talk about this later. Cystitis, pyonephritis, and chills and fever, pyonephritis, and chorioamnionitis. And the way you're going to rule this out is a urinalysis and culture, and we'll talk about that. You should know safe and unsafe immunizations. This is on page 38. And, uh, yep. These are safe. Influenza, all pregnant women should get immunized. We had a patient when I was on the in-service uh, a few weeks ago who was on a ventilator, 100% FiO2, 30 weeks pregnant, flu. Flu. That's, it could have been prevented with a flu vaccination. So influenza, all patients. Hepatitis A and B, not a problem in pregnancy. Pneumococcus, meningococcus is very unusual. Typhoid, we don't usually give. But the influenza, hepatitis, if we need to give it, no problem. Because these are either killed or inactivated organisms. But these you should know for sure. Unsafe immunizations from live attenuated organisms. MMR, measles, mumps. Rubella, polio, yellow fever, varicella, those are un, uh, uncommon. But after delivery, we want to make sure all patients are immunized with the MMR. So the difference between safe and unsafe would be a good board question. Now, this you should be aware of. The CDC has recently, October 2012, recommended Tdap vaccine in pregnancy to all pregnant moms irrespective of the patient's prior history this is not in your notes but it is something you should know for the exam now what is tdap tetanus toxoid diphtheria toxoid a cellular pertussis vaccine tdap all pregnant women optimally between 27 and 36 weeks and if she hasn't got it during the pregnancy, then we should give it after uh, delivery. And the big concern here is the uh, diphtheria is coming back and thousands of children are getting infected. This is uh, my wife and I on Lake Powell water skiing. I'd like to be there right now. Okay, let's take our first 10-minute break. See you in 10.